I'm Carol Klein, and this is my home Glebe Cottage. When I'm not presenting or writing about gardening, this is where I spend most of my time and where I've been honing my horticultural skills for 40 years. Whether you've got a spacious plot, a tiny patio, or a few window boxes, there's nothing more exciting and satisfying than creating your own garden. From basic to more advanced techniques, I believe anyone can learn how to do it. Whether you're a complete novice or an experienced gardener, I want to help you develop the skills to make your garden grow. I'm ready. Are you? Hello and welcome back to my garden here at Glebe Cottage. Over the last few weeks, autumn flowers have continued to open up with big splashes of colour just a few weeks ago, we saw the first of the autumn asters and Michaelmas daisies start to open further down the garden. But the aster that defines this part of the garden is this one, it's Little Carlo. It's called a blue wood aster, and it'll grow in a bit of shade or out in the open here, especially when it's surrounded by these other plants. It really forms these great rivers of blue that run across the garden from bed to bed, right the way through. With that and these big banks of yellow rubecchia, I, I really think it just sets the whole place alight. I wait for this moment every single year. At the top of the brick garden, there's another autumn flowering faithful, but this one has crept in behind my back. What are you doing here? <laughs> every autumn. I come down these steps and see this very beautiful Japanese anemone. They're not from Japan, they're actually from China. And um, look at it and think, you're pink. And don't you know this is the blue and yellow garden? This is the brick garden. But it's not listening to me at all. It's Queen Charlotte anemone hybridum. It started off as a small clump right up next to the cottage. It made its way through that bed across the terrace, into this bed, took it all over, and now it's gone under the path and it's coming out on this side. Look at this. It's obviously got colonising tendencies. I think he'll probably try and take the whole place over. But that just shows you what kind of plant it is and how it lives. It's a woodland plant. Woodland soil is notoriously poor because the tree roots have taken all that goodness. So it has to keep on moving across and finding new places to live, <laughs> which is why when it gets into our gardens, it tends to make great big clumps. And before you know where you are, it just takes over the whole place. But because they're only at this stage for such a short period of time, and because they announce the autumn, I don't see how anybody could ever get fed up of this. In a shady corner of the garden, a less invasive anemone is out to enchant us. This one is called Frilly Knickers on account of all these extra petals around its edge. It's pure white on the inside, but when you turn them over, you see that the reverse of the petals has got this lovely sort of lavender bluish tinge. It's almost like they've been dipped in very dilute ink. It's beautiful. Now, the great thing about this group of anemones is that rather than spreading like mad everywhere and colonizing like the Japanese anemones, they tend to stay in one clump. So they're ideal if you've got limited space, if you've got a smaller garden. And this group will thrive in nice leafy soil and in a bit of shade. Anemones come from a family of plants that includes many autumn flowers. I love them very much and I always want more of them. Don't you think this is so pretty? This is a brand new anemone. 
and it's called Fantasy Pocahontas. And it's got these double pale pink flowers. But this is my all time favorite. This is Anemone Hybrida on Reen Chaubert. And it's one of the most common and yet one of the most special of all these autumn flowering anemones. And they're just a small part of a much larger family, Ranunculaceae, otherwise known as the buttercup family. There are hellebores, clematis, aconites, all sorts of beautiful plants, but none more beautiful than this. There are lots of different ways of making more plants. You can divide them, you can grow them from seed, or you can take cuttings. And even then, there are lots of different sorts of cuttings you can take. You can propagate some plants from leaves, leaf cuttings, some from stems, arasters, for instance, and some from the roots. So I'm going to take lots and lots of root cuttings from this. If we look in this pot, you can see a thicker, thicker roots here and there. So all I'm going to do is tease them out very, very gently. It doesn't matter if I break a few of these finer roots. So these bigger roots would run right around the, the woodland floor. I'll take that piece off there get a couple of cuttings from that and I'll take another couple as well while I'm here. It looks a bit brutal what I'm doing here but in no way will it damage the plants at all. If you look along one of these roots you can already see these little tiny nodules and it's from there that the new shoots come. I'm going to cut those little fibrous roots off the end because I don't need those. So each of these cuttings that I'm making will have nodules all along its length. All you do is just put these pieces horizontally onto the surface of the compost because those shoots will be coming up vertically and at the same time, roots will go down into the compost. Press them down. I'm using this big module tray because when I come to actually potting them on into something bigger, then it means each one has made an individual plant. There won't be any root disturbance at all. There's a nice chunky one. Now, I suppose the best length for these root cuttings is about an inch, 2.5 centimetres. But it's not crucial. The whole tray is going to go into the greenhouse and within a matter of weeks, you'll start to see new shoots. It makes the shoots first, and then it'll make those underground roots. So it wouldn't hurt to leave them a, a matter of a couple of months in there, and then pop them up individually. The reason I'm putting this grit over the surface of the cuttings to retain moisture to keep the weeds down. But the most important thing is it's that weight that's going to keep them in close and intimate contact with the compost. Because if they're sitting proud of the compost, those nodules won't grow and the roots definitely won't. But that should do the trick. I think that's just enough. If you want to try taking anemone cuttings, take a few pieces of thicker roots with nodules. Cut them into short sections, lay them horizontally on the surface of the compost and grow on for a few months until roots have developed. So now I can carry them off triumphantly. And later on, I'll be multiplying more ravishing ranunculus. shines down and lights up this rather dark corner of a garden. It throws into the spotlight this handsome plant. This is Aconitum carmichaelii. It's a monk's hood. It waits until this very moment and it hears the robin singing its autumn song to thrust these great stems upwards and open these beautiful flowers. 
Aconites are a member of Ranunculaceae, the buttercup family. They actually belong to the same family as anemones, although they're quite different. And they create a, a totally different mood too. While the anemone is soft and autumnal, these are striking and slightly strange. In fact, there's something very sinister about the whole plant, and that's probably why I like it so much. And it's so easy to grow if you've got a dark corner and your soil is on the heavy side, it will absolutely thrive. I started off with just one plant and I've split it several times because it's a sterile hybrid. So the only way to make more is to divide it. But be careful when you do, wash your hands afterwards. Because another aspect of its sinister nature is that it's poisonous. If you want to divide, spring is the best time. And who wouldn't want more of this handsome, handsome plant? But some plants are ready for dividing now, especially perennials that flowered much earlier in the year and have now become dormant. I'm trying to dig up a root of this absolutely beautiful spring flowering plant. It's in the buttercup family. It's called Ranunculus aconitifolius floriplano. So it's got these tall branching stems and each one of them is endowed with this beautiful little white flower, just like a, a, a double white buttercup, really. But this is exactly the right time of year to divide it. It's summer dormant. In other words, the whole growth goes back down into the roots. And if you dig it up when it's dormant, you've got a pretty good chance of pulling it apart and of making a whole load of new plants. And you can see by these thong-like roots. You can tell that it comes from damp meadows. It must pull all that moisture up and absolutely thrive in that kind of a place. And I can feel already it wants to fall apart. I think this is really going to work. I'll just plonk it in this convenient shrug. There we go. Look at that, it fills the whole thing. <laughs> and then I'll take it off to divide it. <laughs> Typical, isn't it? Autumn weather. At least it's kept these damp and they're going to get even more damp because the very first thing I want to do with these roots is wash them. I'm just going to work that water into the top, swish it around. It does look otherworldly at the moment. I think that's enough swishy. And this is the crunch point. So I'll get my fingers and thumbs in as much as I can and just try and use these old shoots to tease it apart. Oh look, I'm going to get a couple more out of here. I'll give it a slight twist as well. As long as there's part of the top of the, uh, the crown and little teeny resting buds down in here, and roots, then it can make a viable plant. So that's two for starters. I think I'll give them a quick swish. Oh my good, look at this. Look like octopus or something. <laughs> so two of those. And then, can you see that? I've got these two separate places and I just swish it apart. It's very satisfying. Give that a quick swish. Aren't these roots tremendous? You'd only do this every couple of years. Let the plant build up some strength. A few of them are going to go right back in the ground, but um, I'll just keep them in some moist compost until I've potted the rest. Add just a few crops for drainage and a bit of loam-rich compost. 
and have chosen a long pot because they're very long roots and what I don't want to do is have them turned up at any time because um, the plant won't know where it is. I want to make sure that the crown here where you can see the old shoots coming out and the roots beginning is level with the top of the compost. So as I lower it in, I'll just push it down and make sure there's no air pockets in between the roots and the side of the pot. So every so often, you just want to jiggle your whole pot, push it down, keep hold of that bit. You might lose your plants under the surface of the soil. That would never do. Here we go. Of course, those shoots are dead now, but that's where the new shoots will emerge. Probably about sort of March, April, to see these first green shoots coming up, and then these great big aconite-shaped leaves will will come out, and then these wonderful sprays of flowers. I'm gonna finish the whole thing off with grit. And that'll keep all that moisture underneath there because these are plants that really need moisture. Definitely don't need any sort of special treatment because the cold weather plants are totally hardy and they really love the moisture. I'll tell you what, I might not even need to water them. I'll just leave them out in the rain. If you'd like to have a go at dividing a dormant perennial, give the roots a good wash. Divide so that each piece has a little crown, some resting buds and some roots. Use a deep pot and make sure your compost is level with the crown of the plant. Near the potting shed live some of the loveliest flowering plants in the garden, the peonies. This autumn weather is so unpredictable, but who cares when the sun comes out? It's lovely. In the spring, these plants were at their glamorous best. These enormous, great big pink flowers and lots of white petaloid bits in the centre, making it a real sort of powder puff. It's actually called Bowl of Beauty and that describes it perfectly. It's utterly gorgeous. Until quite recently, there were only two kinds of peonies. There were herbaceous peonies, like this bowl of beauty, which just means they die right down to the ground and over winter you can see nothing at all. And then there are tree peonies, which are actually a kind of shrub. But in the middle of the last century, a totally different peony was introduced and I'm going to plant one of them today. Well, I don't know about bowl of beauty, but this is a barrel full of beauty. Just look at the colour of these beautiful leaves. Aren't they lovely? So this is a third group of peonies, which was developed in Japan by Tioshi Ito. Ito wanted to combine the best qualities of tree peonies and of herbaceous peonies. So he experimented, did lots and lots of crosses and came up with this wonderful range of plants. Very sadly, he died before he saw the results of his labour, those first flowers. But he knew he'd done it, he could tell by the form of the plants. They have very exceptional qualities. They flower for longer than the usual herbaceous peonies, and probably for tree peonies as well. They're sturdy and strong, so even though they've got these magnificent, huge flowers, the stems can still support that weight. So you don't need to bother about staking them or anything like that. And this one that I've chosen to plant here is called Pastel Splendor. It's semi-double. And I want to put it right in here. They love lots of organic matter in the soil. They love a place where they can really enjoy the sun, but they don't mind growing in a little bit of dappled shade. Peonies have tuberous roots, 
and they have these little resting buds from which the new shoots will emerge. And if you put them any deeper than a couple of inches, then those buds can't develop. So you won't get flowers. You'll get some leaves, but no flowers at all. It's a great thing about raised beds. It's a really smashing way of making sure that your plants will truly thrive. And also, it brings them up to your eye level. You feel much more immersed in, in your planting. Right. And now to see what's going on inside the pot. Always a thrilling moment. Quite nice roots. So these are the buds which will make the new shoots for next year. All that remains is to lower it into its planting hole, making sure it's level with the surrounding soil. And then refill with a mix of soil and compost. I always get excited when we see the first buds on the peonies, but next spring I'm in for a special treat. Coming up, I take a trip to see a wild climber that scrambles all over the nation's embankments. One of the most evocative sights at this time of year is to see this gorgeous plant climbing and clambering over hedgerows and up into trees on any country walk. It's a clematis. It's clematis vitalba. It's our only native clematis. It has loads of folk names, old man's beard or traveller's joy, because you see it wherever you're walking. It's absolutely glorious. If you're there earlier in the year, you'll see these little dainty, creamy coloured flowers. But then they're followed by these silken seed heads. And gradually, gradually, they'll get fluffier and fluffier. And in the winter, you can see trees absolutely smothered in this sort of white frost created by the seed heads of this plant. It climbs by hooking these leaves around its host. Here it's clambering up into the trees right over these brambles and right onto the platform. <laughs> this is a railway line. How apt for travellers joy to try and climb over the top and all the way along the platform you can see it. One of the reasons it's called Old Man's Beard, Old Man was the devil. <laughs> and because it's so rapacious in its habit, it can actually smother trees and shrubs. Usually, both of them live happily side by side. Very few of us would have enough room to accommodate this particular plant in our gardens. It really does just scramble over everything. Nothing stops it. There are many wonderful varieties of cultivated clematis to choose for our gardens. And I'm wending my way back to Glebe Cottage to show you some now. But there's something en route that's caught my eye. Look what I found as I'm walking along the platform. There are all these clouds of these pretty little white flowers. It's a white Michaelmas daisy, an aster, and it's absolutely all over the place. This happens because although this is a, a plant of the American prairies, it's been grown in this country for a long time, and it's very often a plant of cottage gardens, and every so often people would chuck things out. And you see this along railway embankments, by road verges everywhere. Over the years, I've had the joy of watching two of my autumn favorites become firm friends. Just look at this beautiful golden hornet crab apple tree. It's absolutely delightful. When we came here, this is one of the first things we planted, so that's 40 years ago or more. And I put it in just as a little sapling and it grew and grew and obviously loves living here. And every year it bears this abundant fruit. About 20 years ago, it suddenly dawned on me, this is the perfect place to grow clematis. So I planted clematis hull dye at its feet. 
it's got pearly white flowers and the back of the flowers is soft sort of lilac and grey and there are hundreds of flowers on it all tumbling down through these branches. I mean all clematis needs a host and this I think is a, a match made in heaven. But well, that's not the end of my matchmaking. I've chosen a new clematis that I know will help to unite two different parts of the garden. I just love it when you get to this stage, when you're surrounded by these plants, you're really immersed in them. It's what autumn is all about for me. And look at that. This is Harrington's pink. And then on the other side is this gorgeous aster with the dark stems and these big single blue daisies. That one's called Calliope. They come into their own at this time of year. The falling temperatures, the lower light, that's what actually initiates their flowering. I love growing this group of asters. Hugely good for butterflies. Red admirals by the score sort of descend on these clumps, as they do too on this one. But one of the reasons I'm here is I want to join Annie's garden. This is my eldest daughter's garden here. And it's blues and purples with my youngest daughter Alice's garden, which is all pinks and whites. So I'm going to plant a clematis. They too are part of Ranunculaceae, the buttercup family, just like all those anemones. Some clematis varieties are still in flower now. And in years to come, I think they're really going to set each other off as you walk through here on a sunny autumnal day. I've chosen this pretty lilac blue variety, which will look perfect here. Which one would you choose? When you go to fire clematis, it can be a bit confusing. There are literally thousands of varieties to choose from. You want to choose something that's going to flower at the right time of year, and you want to choose something that's going to love the kind of space you can give it. But even if you've got a very limited space, even a balcony, you can easily grow a clematis in a pot, and you really make use of all that upward space. This is a clematis belonging to a new series called a Boulevard series, and she's called Diana's Delight. It doesn't matter what it is, they all enjoy the same sort of conditions. So the simple rule is roots in the shade, top in the sun, and make sure you plant it really, really well. And prepare your soil properly. I'm just going to extract some of the soil because I want a nice deep hole. When you're plucking any plant in at all, but especially one like this, that's going to be here for a long time and you really want to make it feel at home and one with really good deep roots and you want to excavate a hole that's at least twice the size of a root bulb, probably up to four times and what I want to do, although this soil is lovely heavy stuff, just the kind of soil that clematis really adore, if I can just add some of this this is straight off our compost heap. Absolutely delicious stuff. And I'm going to add it to the soil that I've extracted. So a bit of that back in the hole, around the edge first of all. I think that's probably deep enough. But I hope this is going to work. Yeah. Now, can you see these lovely, big, thick roots? I mean, this is a young plant. And I think that's exactly the right sort of stage. It's going to love living in here. Look at it with the sun through it. Isn't that beautiful? And of course, it's going to climb much higher than this. It's going to be about, I don't know, three metres tall with a bit of luck. So lowering it down, that's not bad. It's just about the right level there. And I've already put a bit of good compost in underneath it. So, this is the important bit. Now I've mixed it with the soil. It's a good texture too. It'll allow those roots to spread out gently into the soil around. 
When you're planting anything, that's vitally important. You must make sure that you prepare all that soil around and look. There's a pulmonary area on the other side that's going to provide shade. And what's more, it'll provide shade for those roots all the year round because it's evergreen. So it's an ideal plant, really, for that position. And its top is definitely going to end up in the sun. And then really firm it in. This is a climber. If you're going to climb, you've got to have some sort of support. So at the moment, this is just attached by a series of ties to this bamboo cane. And that's how you usually buy a clematis. I'm going to put this onto a great big obelisk, but you can grow them up anything at all. This is not the easiest thing in the world to manipulate, but I'm going to give it a whirl. You haven't locked me up for going on the clematis. This is just this lovely iron frame that I have made to fit in a couple of pots at the top. And I think it's going to be ideal in here, providing I can get it in place. Here goes. Don't laugh. That's it. So when you've got it to this stage, then you've got to make sure that you take it away from the support it's had while it's been growing in its pot and initiate it into the process of climbing up the structure you've provided. Now this one's tied onto its bamboo, but look at this. You can see just how a clematis actually hangs onto its host. It had wrapped this leaf stem right round the bamboo cane. And that's what they do, they just hook themselves over and drag themselves up and up and up they go. Now I'm untying these ties, you can see that what they've done is to actually bend the top down so it can go on the shorter stick. But what we've actually got is a much taller clematis than we first thought. So I'll carefully take this cane out now. So this is the bit that had been folded over and was going downwards. Now it's got to change direction and go upwards. So these flowers, although they're downturned at the moment, will very soon right themselves. And then this growing point down here will head for the sky and it'll grow right up here. And then next year there may be several more shoots. If you've planted it a bit deep and you mulch it really, really well, it will encourage the new shoots to form at the base. During the winter, all you'll see is these bare stems still probably clinging onto this. It's like a tree in that it, it keeps this structure over the winter and then new shoots will come out here, there and everywhere and hopefully lots more at the base too and eventually this obelisk will be clothed in a cloak of blue. I'm going to give it a really good soak. And with any newly planted plant, you want to make sure that you water very thoroughly for the first few weeks until it's established. I think we'll probably have en enough autumn rain to carry the process on after that. If you're planting a clematis at home, choose a spot where the roots are shaded and the flowers are in the sun. Give the roots plenty of space and prepare the soil well. Give it some sort of support, canes or an obelisk. Well, there's a whole mystique too about how you prune clematis, when you do it, how much do you take off? And really the rules are pretty simple. With large flowered clematis, you probably don't need to prune them at all, just take off anything that's not growing the way you want it to. With early flowers, if you're going to prune them, and they probably won't need it, do it after they've finished flowering. With viticellas, that's my holdine growing up the crabapple tree. And with this boulevard series, it's such a simple process. All you do is take your secateurs to each individual shoot and cut them down to about that much from the ground in February. And then they'll spring into growth again. Even if you cut every single clematis down to a few inches high, they're still going to regrow and give you beautiful flowers. 
coming up, it's climbers of the edible variety. I want to pinch their pods. Lovely thing, blowing in the breeze. This is a, a climbing bean, Maraviglia di Venice. Marvel of Venice, and it has been marvellous too. Absolutely delicious early on when those pods are quite thin. You just cook it gently, slice it up, and have it with dressing, and it is one of the most beautiful things. But it's also an incredibly beautiful plant. But that's not why I'm here, to admire their beauty. I want to pinch their pods. <laughs> oh, let's pull that off. Look at that. You can just feel those beams right along the length. Now I'll dry these off. There are a few here too, which are drier still. And then I'll pod them, take out those beams, store them when they're perfectly dry in a sort of cool but shady place. And next spring, I'll sow them again, and the whole cycle will start once more. Do you know, if you've just got a small garden or limited space, then no reason at all why you can't just make a, an obelisk from bamboo canes or whatever you can find and grow a few beans up it. Not only will it be wonderfully productive, but you'll have all that beauty all summer long, and then bees to look at in the autumn. So much of what we do in autumn is about preparing for the coming seasons. Some jobs are a real treat. What do you think I've got in here? It's not chocolates, it's something much better. It's alliums, these lovely big solid bulbs. This is an allium called Schubertii and it makes these sort of fireworks almost kind of Roman candles with shoots going out in every direction. At the end of each one of them is a little purple flower. It's magnificent. So I'm going to put some in this lovely concrete pot, but it's covered in moss here. And once we've enjoyed their spring display in these pots and I've taken off the old flower heads, I'll probably plant them right out into the garden. I'll have them for years and years and years. They're already old friends. So I'm just going to put this gorgeous compost in here. There's um, loads of loam in this again because it's got to sustain these bulbs and make sure that they make these big starbursts in the spring. And I think I'll probably only get about five in here. And I'm just going to push them straight in there. Pointy end up and the base plate underneath where the roots are going to come. Aren't they lovely? Can you see the new bulb underneath here? So this outer casing will just fall away and they'll swell and be utterly gorgeous. Now, because they've all got a fairly big spherical head, I can't put any more than five in here or they'd be competing with each other. And then all I do is put some more compost right over the top. I love doing this. I mean, it's such a really gusty, windy day, but I just feel as though I'm settling these down and they can spend the winter nestled down in there until they come up in the spring and give us all a wonderful surprise. Enjoy yourselves, have a nice sleep. Such a poser, this cat. Look, a pause exactly matches this white cyclamen. That's it, you sit down on there. <laughs> Come on. Autumn is such a changeable season. Here comes the rain again. Time to escape into the greenhouse to continue my preparations for next year. More bulbs 
but these ones will flower much earlier than my alliums. Absolutely pouring dough. I'm doing something really, really special here. It's going to be a, a sort of end of winter, beginning of spring treat. It's something to look forward to. Although I won't see anything for absolutely ages. I adore this pot. I'm going to fill it full of winter aconite, Eranthus, Hyamalis. Hyamalis just means winter flowering. And these are the first of the ranunculaceae that you see in the garden. You can tell immediately that they belong to the buttercup family because they've got bright yellow flowers, polished petals, just like celandines and buttercups. The flower is surrounded by a, a bright green roof, which just sort of makes the most beautiful background. And they look up at you in the, the first of the spring sunshine. So I want to put them into this pot. They're actually bulbs. I've got them soaking because that helps them swell a little bit so they'll be faster into growth because we want them to put the roots down pretty promptly if we can. So crocs in first, very carefully, very gently. I'm going to plant a few snowdrops in there as well. <laughs> I'm going to plant the snowdrops first because they need to go down much deeper. When I'm planting my snowdrops, I want them to be about this deep. Now, I've just dug these up. <laughs> They're all wet through. And you can see they're just beginning to make root. So I'm just putting them all around this edge in a very kind of random way. Now, a great big layer of compost on the top because these eranthus just want to be not superficial, but only a couple of inches below the surface of the soil. So I've got that to within a couple of inches of the top now. I'll firm it down just a little bit. That's it. And then I'll extract my aranthus. And I'm just going to tip them in here, there and everywhere. Not a pattern. Just a, a random planting. So when they come up, not only will they look beautiful, but they'll be a treat for your nose as well, because both these flowers smell absolutely gorgeous. Next time, if you think old brown stuff is the same, think again. I'm the king of the castle. I'll be showing you how to make your own gorgeous leaf mould. I'm the queen of the leaf mould heap. And I've got a good idea for a strawberry planter that's been gathering dust here for ages. Look at that, what a beautiful pot. We've had absolutely everything this week. We've had blazing sunshine and pouring rain. Typical autumn weather. But who cares, as long as you're out in the garden. And I will be next week. And I hope you're going to join us then for more gardening. Bye.